I know it's hard to believe, but I used to be a youth sponsor too. Many, many years ago. Long time ago, back in Pennsylvania. And one weekend, we took our youth up to Zion Bible Institute, also called Zion Bridal Institute, because many got married there, but not going there. Zion Bible Institute, and we took our youth up there. And they did a skit that I remember to this day. And if you learn something in the service that you retain for 40 years, that's pretty powerful. Amen? Here's what they did. They brought one young man up, and they stood him right here, and they said, this young man will be playing the part of Jesus today. Okay? They put down the lights. That door opens up, and some kid comes flying through that door like he's driving a little sports car, right? He comes up here. He skids. He goes flying back here, right? He sees Jesus. He hits the brakes, and he goes, whoa, Jesus, going for a ride today. You want to come? The young man playing Jesus doesn't even look at him. He shakes his head no. The guy driving the car says, okay, suit yourself. Brrr, out that way, out that door. And you're sitting there pondering, what is the meaning of this? And all of a sudden, that door opens again, and another car comes through. It's a young lady. She's driving a Jeep. She's got people with her. Got a surfboard. Got the whole deal. They're talking the whole way up here, right? They get here, they get before they get to Jesus, and they see Jesus, and they jam on the brakes. And like, Jesus, we're going to go surfing today. Come on, you want to go? The waves are really good today. And again, a young man playing Jesus doesn't even look at him. Eyes straight ahead, just shakes his head no. And now I'm really wondering what's going on. They take off that way, they go out that back door, and they're gone. And there's this pause. And then the door opens again. And some young lady, just like an elderly woman, comes in, and she's putting, put, put, put. and for dramatic effect, like drawing this out, you know what I'm saying? Like I am with this story right now. She's drawing this out, right? And she gets here, and she sees Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to the store. Come along with me. And the young man does the same thing. Eyes straight ahead, shakes his head no. And she put, 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 and out that door. And then the lights go really dim. And the young man steps forward and says, I never ride along. I only drive. I have remembered that for almost 40 years. And I'm going to ask you the same question. Who is driving your life today? Who's at the wheel? Because I will tell you for me in my life, when I drive, it's a little bumpy. There's a lot of red lights. And I get some speeding tickets because I'm trying to get there too fast. But when I let him drive, it's a lot smoother. The road is a little windy, but I always get there right on time. Amen? So we are in James chapter 3 today. And you're going to wonder as we read these verses what that has to do with who's driving your life. I'm going to tie it together at the end. You stay with me, okay? All right, here we go. James chapter 3. Background in the book of James. We've been in James now for what, seven, eight weeks, I believe? So here's some background as a reminder. The author of James is the half-brother of Jesus. If you're wondering why he's the half-brother, please see me after the service. <laughs> James became a believer after the resurrection. So he wasn't a believer during the life of Jesus. James was a leader, according to the book of Acts, uh, leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was writing to Jewish Christians who had left Jerusalem probably via persecution. And in fact, James himself was martyred for his faith. He was an early martyr for his faith, one of the earliest ones. Two primary reasons why we study the book of James. One, examine the relationship between faith and works. And if you were here two weeks ago, Pastor Mike did an amazing job talking about faith by works and faith by, or salvation by faith, salvation by works. If you haven't seen it, I recommend go check it out on our website. The second reason to explore the impact of our faith on life in our city 
in our world, right? Faith without works is dead. To explore the impact of our faith on life in our city and our world. And that aligns perfectly with the mission of Journey Church. So you've come to the right place. Here's our mission. And you should know this by heart. I shouldn't even have to put that up there, but I gave you a freebie. Our mission to see our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. And that mission will not change, Journey Church. That is our mission. That's why we exist. And how do you do that? Faith by works, right? I've been in office buildings, and I've seen when a new believer comes in, it changes the environment, right? When you come to salvation and you enter into a city, you change the environment, Journey Church, we're going to change. He is going to change the environment. That's our mission. Amen? Okay, James chapter 3. Just five verses today, but that's okay. I have plenty of supporting verses. Don't worry. I got you covered. James chapter 3. Pastor Adam did up through 13. We're going to pick it up at uh, verse 14 today. And he gave me the good verses. Jealousy and selfish ambition. (laughs) I'm not jealous about what he taught last week at all. Trust me. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, some translations say bitter envy or self-seeking. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly natural. He even says demonic. He just raised the ante, didn't he? It's okay to be earthly and natural, but he just went there. It's demonic. That's a whole new level, folks. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed of and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That is a pretty powerful set of verses, is it not? As a believer, that should get your attention. Amen. So that is the NASB 2020 version. I'm going to read it to you also in the message. Translation. I wouldn't typically teach out the message because it is a paraphrase, right? There are word for word translations, thought for thought, and then paraphrase. That's the message. It's a paraphrase. You've heard somebody say before, let me paraphrase, right? So it is a paraphrase. I wouldn't typically teach out of it, but I love how it brings some points out. So let's read this. It's a little lengthy, but stick with me. Amen? You still with me? I've only been up here for like six minutes. I mean, Here we go. Do you want to be counted wise to build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well. Live wisely. Live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. If you have to tell me you're wise... Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the farthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish plotting. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart. And everyone ends up at the other's throats. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. Can't we all just get along? (laughs) Jesus said they will know you by your love for one another. And that's not just the people in the walls of Journey Church. That's the capital C. Amen? It's gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings. Not hot one day, cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. 
So three points out of today's message. I'm going to take them out of order. Wisdom, jealousy, which I love to tackle jealousy, and selfish ambition. Let's do wisdom first. So there are two sources of wisdom that James tells us about, right? The kind of wisdom that comes from God that is pleasing to God and is good for your life. There's also the kind that does not come from God, is not pleasing to God, and it is not good for your life. It views the world in a limited earthly perspective. It sees things in the here and now, not in the eternal. Does that make sense? It's also dangerous and is motivated by self-centered ambition. We need godly wisdom that comes from heaven is what you and I need. And that takes us back to James chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. James wrote back then, now if any man lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives all generously and without criticizing and it will be given to him. So we ask for wisdom from the Lord. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord, or reverence is also a translation there, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So wisdom begins in reverence to the Lord. If I don't reverence the Lord, I'm probably not going to go for godly wisdom, am I? I'm probably seeking the wisdom of the world. Proverbs 2, 1 through 7 says this. This is Solomon. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. Solomon pointed out a number of ways in that passage that we should seek and search after wisdom. He said, one, we should receive wisdom. You're not born wise. Newsflash, right? You need to receive wisdom. Treasure. Many of us have possessions that we treasure. I should treasure wisdom. Incline. The Latin there actually means toward. The thought there is to lean in, right? You've ever been in a conference room and you're talking to somebody and they lean in, right? You got their attention. They're bought in. They're listening to you as opposed to leaning back with their arms crossed, right? The thought here is lean in to wisdom. Apply. It's great to have wisdom, but you got to apply that wisdom. Amen? So you should apply wisdom. Cry out. Lift up the voice. Seek and search for wisdom. So I ask you again, where does your wisdom come from? I hope it's the Bible and not Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. And I'm not joking. I'm dead serious. I'm on a page in Facebook. It's a revelation page. And it is the most hateful page in all of Facebook history. It has to be. They argue every single day about the rapture. When is it going to happen? They call each other false prophets. They blast each other. These are a bunch of believers talking about theology, and it is the worst page in the entire world for sure. I see the craziest theories on there. Please do not get your theology from Facebook. We as a church, we as a church do not put our position papers on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook. Amen? Amen? The Word of God. Study the Word of God. Seek and search the Word of God. That's where you get wisdom. That's where you get godly wisdom. I know that sounds so basic and elementary, but it needs to be repeated. It needs to be stated. Amen? You still with me? Jacob, you with me, bro? All right, cool. Second point, jealousy. Now, I know when I say jealousy, a lot of things go through your mind immediately. But let's keep it with the definition of this jealousy. (laughs) Jealousy is a feeling or state of resentment, bitterness, or hostility 
towards someone because they have something that you don't. So is there anybody better equipped in all the world to teach you and me about jealousy than James, whose older brother just happened to be the son of God? (laughs) Does anybody really think Joseph spanked Jesus? Come on, no way. I'm pretty sure he wanted to spank Jesus, and he probably gave those to James. So James took a couple for the team. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) So if anybody understands jealousy, it's James. (laughs) Jealousy is pretty sneaky. It's not like lying, right? You tell a lie, boom, you know it. I lied. I sinned. I just lied, right? Jealousy sneaks in. It's really sneaky. Let me give an example. I used to have the most beautiful Harley Davidson, ultra classic, the bike of all bikes. Okay, it was a nice bike, but it was. It was an ultra classic, you know, Harley. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The biggest bike on the market. It was a beauty. One of my dear brothers who's on staff here, who will remain nameless, got a little Honda that had a purple-blue paint job. It was nice, you know. But he brought it to the first ride, and we're all like, oh, yeah, that's nice. I said, oh, that's a nice bike, you know, nice bike. So him and I used to ride together, he and I, and on three occasions, well, on the first occasion, we happened to be at Sonic, and somebody's going through the line, and they stop, and they're like, oh, they roll down the window. And they're like, oh, nice bike. And I think they're talking about my bike. <laughs> no, they're talking about this little blue purple bike. <laughs> I'm like, oh. All right, cool, no problem. It happened again. And the third time, (laughs) we're in this little park a lot, and some guy goes by, he gets to the stop sign or the traffic light, he makes a U, he buzzes back around, he comes all the way back around and says, hey, nice bike. And he's talking about the other bike again. And by now, I'm like, come on, man. I'm really resentful, right? But it started with, that's a nice bike. And it got to, you don't like my bike, you like the other bike. That's how jealousy creeps in. You've got to be careful. You have got to guard your heart. He actually said jealousy is demonic, right? So we have got to guard our hearts. And unfortunately for mankind, it only took one generation for jealousy to creep in. Four chapters in Genesis, and we see jealousy already wrecking havoc on mankind. You don't think jealousy is a problem? It's a big problem. Genesis chapter 4. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. Could say his, could say his motorcycle, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but Cain, and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well... Will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel's brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel and killed his brother. Four chapters in, we see a murder as the result of jealousy. In Israel as a nation, because they are God's chosen people, have suffered jealousy for their entire existence. So I want to talk to you today about spiritual jealousy. There, of course, is sibling jealousy, right, with Joseph and his brothers, and there is spousal jealousy, but I want to talk to you today about spiritual jealousy. And I want to give you a good example recently. So Azusa Street, for those of you that don't know, in 1906, a revival broke out in Los Angeles in a place called Azusa Street. It was a rundown stable, a mission, if you will, in 1906. And thousands and thousands came. And thousands were healed and saved and set free and filled with the Holy Spirit. They came in 1906 from all over the world. All over the world, people came to Azusa Street to experience the power and the presence of God. But Azusa Street, well, let me give you the description of Azusa Street from those that attended Azusa Street. 
Here's how they describe the meetings. No instruments of music are used. None are needed. No choir. The angels have been heard by some in the spirit. (laughs) No collections are taken. You don't need to take a collection when a presence and a power of God are there. People just give. There was a box at the door. They just gave. No bills have been posted to advertise the meetings. They didn't advertise their meetings. They would start at 11 o'clock in the morning, maybe, and they would go to 2 o'clock that night. Hours and hours. 300 to 1,000 people came to Azusa Street every single day for over six years. No church organization was behind it. And all who are in touch with God realized as soon as they entered the meetings that the Holy Ghost was the leader. Can I get an amen to that one? So that's how those who attended described Azusa Street. Here's how the Los Angeles Times described it. The meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street. Man, that was true. The devotees of this weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories, and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. <laughs> Sounds like encounter some nights, right? <laughs> The night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying back and forth in this nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. <laughs> They claim to have the gift of tongues and to be able to understand the babble. Now, I understand the world attacking a move of God like that. I expect that. I get that, right? What I don't understand is the ministers and the pastors in Los Angeles who responded by telling their congregants, do not go to Azusa Street. Come on. On three occasions, the fire department was called to Azusa Street because there were flames coming out of the building. Only for the fire department to get there and there'd be no smoke, no flames, nothing charred. Only the fire, the Holy Spirit inside going crazy as people were lifting up the Holy Spirit. Three occasions that occurred, documented in the Los Angeles Times. What I don't understand is how can a church tell their congregants, don't go there? How can you walk by a building every single day where obviously the power of the Holy Spirit is flowing and moving and you as a believer don't sense that? Because you've got spiritual jealousy in your heart? Do not miss a move of God over spiritual jealousy. When you see your fellow believers pressing in, getting slain in the Spirit, getting healed, receiving the gifts, whatever, Don't be jealous. Do not be jealous. Jesus is the giver. He gives the gifts. Amen? They criticized the movement. They attacked the participants. They called the cops on the mission. (laughs) And they argued about their theology. Can I just tell you, they're still arguing about that exact same theology today. (laughs) 120 years later, we're still arguing about the same theology. Let me give you another example in the Word of God. Arguably the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in all of history. At the day of Pentecost. And the Pharisees criticized the movement. And And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. The Pharisees had jealousy and selfish ambition, and they missed a move of God. Journey Church started doing freedom probably, what, seven years ago? Where are my freedom people at? Freedom folks, all right. 
seven, six, seven years ago, we started doing Freedom, I believe. And the very first, for those of you who don't, don't know what Freedom is, it is a 12-week course that ends with a one- or two-day conference, the Freedom Conference. And the Freedom Conference is amazing. Everybody should do a Freedom Conference. So we started doing Freedom six or seven years ago. And I didn't go to the first semester, but I was asked to speak at the Freedom Conference the second day, the next to last session, I believe. So I went that whole day because I just wanted to see what, what is this, what's this freedom all about? Right? What is this? Right? Man, did God move that day. Amen. Did he move that day? And I remember telling that group that day back in the annex, this felt like Journey Church's day of Pentecost. Because that's what it felt like. There was a shift that day in the atmosphere. No doubt about it. The second year, I'm like, all right, I'm getting in on this. Right? So I went to Freedom. And again, I was asked to speak, I think, the Baptism and Holy Spirit session, which is the last session, right? The conference was amazing. The presence of God was so real in that building. We were in this room that day, those two days. Sunday service was amazing. And I could just, I had the Holy Spirit tingles for three days. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I just sensed the presence of God for three days. And Monday morning, I'm sitting in my office and I work out of my house. My office is right by my front door, and I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm recapping the weekend and praising God. And it starts to rain outside. And in me, my mind, I'm thinking, oh, he symbolized the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? So I walk out my door, and I stand in my little patio area, and I'm just, I'm just praising God for pouring out his Spirit. And immediately it starts to rain heavier. And I sense the Holy Spirit say, there's more. I'm not done yet. There is more of my Holy Spirit that I am going to pour out. There's more to come. And as I'm praising him for that, a little car drives by. I think it was a VW drives by. Wipers on. The guy's inside. He's not getting touched by the rain at all, right? Windows up. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, but there will be some who will miss it. They won't know what's happening. That happened at Azusa Street. There were believers in the area that didn't know what was happening. And then another car drove by. And I heard him say, and there will be some who will reject what I'm doing. And that's exactly what they did in Los Angeles. They rejected the move of God. But it didn't stop the move of God. Azusa Street went all over the world. Every denomination today, Pentecostal denomination today, in large part, traces their roots right back to Azusa Street. Right? So God did what God was going to do. Amen. He's going to do what he's going to do here, Journey Church. Yeah. And about five months ago, I was over here worshiping, and the Lord reminded me of that vision. And it reminded me that in the Old Testament, many prophecies have a short-term fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment. And it reminded me, when I, started, when I told you I was pouring out my spirit in a greater measure, I'm not finished. So I believe there's more to come for Journey Church. Amen? Selfish ambition. I really got to get moving here. Y'all talk too much. <laughs> selfish ambition, the last one. Here we go. Here is the definition. In the Bible, selfish ambition is a sin that is characterized by a focus on one's own wants and desires and a disregard for others and God. It is a me mentality that is self-centered and contaminates motives for action. Selfish ambition is focused on you and your wants and desires. It centers on what you can get from a person, place, thing, or situation. Selfish ambition thinks your needs, wants, and desires are above others and God. And you can see why that is so evil and demonic. It puts you here and God here. There are some examples in the Bible, of course, King David and Bathsheba. Uriah the Hittite, he had killed. Uriah the Hittite was an honorable man. He was one of his top 30 soldiers in an over one million man army. He was in the top 30. And King David had him killed for his selfish ambition. King Ahab and Naboth, Naboth had a beautiful vineyard that King Ahab just had to have it. But Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. 
So he went home whining and complaining. And Jezebel said, stop your whining, I'll take care of it. And she did. She had him killed. And they took the vineyard and gave it to Ahab. Selfish ambition kills physically and spiritually. Charles Colson, Chuck Colson, very successful, self-made man, had his own law firm, cabinet member under President Nixon, guilty in his role for Watergate, went to prison, became a believer before he went to prison, set up the Prison Fellowship Ministry. Thousands and thousands have been saved either directly by him or his ministry. But here's what he said about ambition. I was ambitious, and I am ambitious today. But my hope is not for Chuck Colson. My ambition is now for Christ. So there are two controlling ambitions, one for your glory or one for God's glory. And you have to apply your ambitions for the Lord. Amen? Amen. So who is driving your ambitions? Let me give you three keys to avoiding the sin of jealousy and selfish ambition. Number one, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16, 17 says this, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these two are in opposition to one another. So that you may not do the sum, you may not do the things that you please. So, Catherine Coleman, I love to share this story. I know Pastor Mike knows this story. Catherine Coleman, and those of you who don't know Catherine Coleman, an incredible evangelist in the last century. Thousands saved, healed under her ministry, right? Catherine Coleman. Incredible woman of God, incredible evangelist. She spoke at Carnegie Hall many, many times. And one night she's walking out to Carnegie Hall. She gets to the stage door, and there's a gentleman with her, and she grabs the black doorknob to open the stage door, and she stops. And she says, I have died a thousand deaths holding this doorknob. What did she mean by that? Catherine Coleman knew that she didn't save a single person. She didn't heal a single person. She didn't baptize anybody with the Holy Spirit. She knew that she had to die to self Yield the flesh and let the Holy Spirit take over as she walked out on that stage. Every time I walk on stage, I come up to pray, I teach in JBC, in my mind, I physically or view that I'm grabbing a black doorknob to remind myself to crucify the flesh that it's not me. I heard Pastor Mike say this. I heard Pastor Mike say two weeks ago, we have a rail back here. We don't have a black doorknob, but we have a rail Mike, Pastor Mike knows this story. I heard him say a couple weeks ago, he did the same thing. He grabbed that rail so he could crucify the flesh and roll up here in the spirit. Amen? You still with me? We're almost done. Number two, here we go. Do not measure yourself against others. Remember who you are in Christ. Others are not your bar, right? Jesus sets your bar. And your bar has nothing to do with anybody else's bar. Amen? Galatians 6, 4 and 5. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Comparing yourself only leads to feelings of inadequacy or pride, and both of those are bad. God sees beyond the outward appearance, and he judges the heart, right? So don't measure yourself against others. Your identity, your value, your purpose all come from him, not nobody else, not even your spouse. Amen? Your value and your worth come from him and him alone. Final point, Ramos home. Number three, don't worry what others think or say about you. Again, your worth is not tied to them. Your worth comes from the Lord. You need to focus on our relationship with God and God alone. So what does this have to do with who's driving your life? I told you I'd get back to it, right? If I'm walking in the spirit, if I don't care what others say about me, then obviously Jesus is driving my life. Because when he drives, 
I have what I need. I don't have selfish ambitions. My ambition is him. My drive is him. Motivation is him and his, him alone. Amen. Would you stand?